Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us at the Marion Woodward Symposium this morning for Navigating the Tempest Nursing Practice During COVID-19. So you can see that um, the panelists and I are in a recording studio, appropriately physically distanced um, at UBC. And thank you uh, to uh, the recording folks who are helping us today. Um, so my name is Sabrina Wong. I'm a professor at the School of Nursing and the Associate Director for Research. And I'm pleased to welcome you today. To begin with, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Margaret Moss. Dr. Moss is an enrolled member of the Mandan Hidatsa and Akrakura Nation. My apologies for not um, pronouncing that correctly. These are three affiliated tribes of Northern North Dakota and has equal lineage as a Canadian Sioux and in Saskatchewan. She is currently director of the First Nations House of Learning and associate professor in the School of Nursing. Dr. Moss will lead us in opening today's session with a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Sabrina. So I would like to acknowledge that UBC is located and operates on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Hunkamian-speaking Musqueam people, and is where I'm speaking from you today, for you, to you today. Personally, I want to acknowledge that I'm here from my territory of the three affiliated tribes of North Dakota, located in the U.S., and here as a traveler. Hidatsa, one of my tribes, translates to people of the willows, which is all along the Missouri River. Musqueam refers to a people of a flowering plant, so named, with, which grows in the Fraser River estuary. So finding shared connections is an important practice when in another place. We respect their holding of the land for thousands of years and acknowledge that many of us enjoy it today. So we offer a recognition to show respect for the original people of the land but also importantly, recognition of the vibrant current context, presence and lives of the Musqueam people today and for the future. Thank you. As this is our first ever fully online Marion Woodward lecture and symposium, we are excited to have attendees joining us from all over British Columbia today and beyond. The focus of today's panel is navigating the Tempest nursing practice during COVID-19 is going to talk about the myriad of ways COVID-19 has been impacting health and healthcare in British Columbia and beyond. So without delay, I'd like to turn over the mic to our moderator, UBC Assistant Professor of Nursing, Dr. Naz Have, who will introduce our panelists. Sure, thank you, Sabrina. So as Sabrina said, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Naz Hawaii. I'm a health services researcher and a relatively new assistant professor at UBC School of Nursing. And I've been doing some research related to um, sort of impact of COVID-19 on nurses' mental health and also in the long-term care sector, examining sort of the intended and unintended consequences of some of the um, pandemic management policies and practices, both on staff, residents, and their family members. So it's actually my pleasure to be moderating today's symposium. There is probably very little disagreement that the COVID-19 pandemic turned, to, turned into almost this global crisis in which nursing played a very important role, both in terms of responding to it, responding, this, responding to this crisis, and also leading it. So I'd like to start our panel discussion by first expressing my profound gratitude to all of you who have been in one way or another uh, you know, responding to this uh, uh, sort of crisis and managing the pandemic and also welcome you to our 2020 symposium. So we have a fantastic um, panel of nursing experts in the area of practice, policy, um, leadership, and education with us today. And we will be having some dialogue, um, as Sabrina said, about COVID-19 and its impact on health and healthcare. So most of our panelists are here with us in person, but we also have a panelist who's based in London, um, UK and joining us virtually. 
So our first panelist is my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Bombush, Associate Professor at UBC School of Nursing and Sex and Gender Science Chair at Canadian Institute for Health Research. Um, our second panelist, uh, who is actually a graduate of our own MSN program at UBC School of Nursing, is a clinical nurse specialist for the critical program at Providence Healthcare with nearly 20 years of experience as an ICU nurse. Our third panelist is um, uh, Natasha Podenbala. Uh, Natasha is the Chief Nurse and Professional Practice Officer in the Ministry of Health in British Columbia. And uh, she actually leads the nursing policy secretariat providing a strategic direction and oversight for all nurses and midwives in the province. And la last but not least, uh, our uh, final panelist who's joining virtually is Yvonne Coghill, the Director of Workforce Race Equality at NHS London and Deputy President at Royal College of uh, Nursing. So with this brief introduction that, you know, probably did not do justice to our panelists, I'd like to first welcome you um, to our session and have you tell us a bit about yourself and what two things about the area of nursing practice you are most passionate about, starting with you, Jennifer. Okay, thank you, Naz, and thank you for having me and Welcome to my fellow panelists. It's um, an honor and a pleasure to be on this panel. So my name is Jennifer and I have been a nurse, I think for 25 years. And I started um, my interest in nursing as a Vincent teen at St. Vincent's Hospital, for those who remember that, in Vancouver over 30 years ago. And so for a long time, I've been immersed in caring for and caring about people. And I think um, two areas of nursing that I'm most passionate about, I think probably I'm most known for being very passionate about nursing care of older people. And that's been a driving force in my career and practice education and research. And um, particularly long-term care where I um, found my home in terms of where I wanted to spend my professional career. And the other area, um, I've been reflecting on this for a couple of days, and I think it really comes down to person and family-centered care. And that's always been at the core of my work, and that continues to be at the core of my program of research. So really thinking about um, how we care for the person and care with the person and with their family on their healthcare journey. So that would be me. Excellent. Thank you. We'll sort of pass on our invisible mic <laughs> to Vinny. Yeah, well, thank you again for inviting me. It's, it really is an honor when I heard that I was even considered for it. It was like super exciting. So um, I really, um, so I'll start telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a nurse for about 20 years. The, I did my one year of medicine and my one year of surgery, but I really always knew that I wanted to be a critical care nurse. Um, so as soon as I, I, I broke down the doors to BCIT to get into the BCIT critical care program so I could be an ICU nurse, um, I um, uh, worked at the bedside at VGH for about 17 years. Um, and, um, and then um, I did, went back and did my master's. Um, and I, I was in just ex, um, amazed with the research component of nursing and how we really could participate in building the science of it. Um, and then I stepped into this role of a clinical nurse specialist, which really for me was like the best of both worlds. I get to stay in the ICU, but I also get to take a look at the science of critical care nursing and the, and the system that we, uh, we deliver care in. How can we make that system a bit better? Um, the reason why I'm so passionate about critical care, um, one, it's, it's the, the science of it. It's the physiology and the complexity and the ABGs and the ICPs, all those components of physiology, they seduce me. I really do enjoy that kind of complexity. And ICU is, is a place where it takes a really long time to be an expert, which is for someone like me, wonderful. Um, and the other thing is it's also um, a time in people's lives that are unplanned. It's often a crisis. Um, it's it's a, a strange place to be an ICU patient. Um, and it's, it's a traumatic po point in someone's life. Um, and so that relational work that goes along with critical care nursing is, is uh, really intense and inspiring. It's, it's an opportunity to be at someone's side to help them through that 
uh, moment. And it's hard for sure. There's ethical dilemmas, but it's, it's, um, it's rewarding as well. And before you think I'm a masochist thinking, why would she want to work in this place? It's also the team that I get to work with. So I, I don't navigate this by myself. I navigate this with an incredible team of people who really show me what it is to be amazing. And I do my best to live up to their, their um, uh, role models. Excellent, thank you. And Natasha? Thank you, and thank you for having me as well. And thank you and hi to my fellow panelists. Great to see you, Yvonne, all the way from the UK. Uh, so my nursing practice started um, in acute cardiac surgery, and then I've also worked in primary care in the downtown east side in Vancouver. And then I worked um, in uh, women's health. Um, and now I'm currently, even in this role, I'm still practicing one day a week in the Women's um, Heart Center at um, BC Women's Hospital, as well as the Access Clinic for Women with Disabilities, um, feeding access to gynecological care. For me, when I looked at this question, I thought, wow, what am I not passionate about currently? And I would say that COVID-19 has really highlighted some of the areas where the nursing profession are, can really shine, and you really can see the expertise of us as a profession. And where do we step in and lead within that? So for me, a good segue is around team-based care. I'm currently the chair of the Provincial Team-Based Care Advisory Group, which is a provincial group looking at how do we support um, and ensure that we're actually changing practice such that we're working as teams and we're wrapping care around the patient um, and figuring out what needs to be done from a patient perspective. So that's number one. Um, and I just see opportunity for us as nurses to lean in there. And then number two, I think that I really see a lot of opportunity in the Truth um, and Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Again, when I think about nursing expertise and where we can lead um, the system is really trying to figure out um, how to lead and um, work with these calls to action. And I really think nursing as a profession has an opportunity to do that. And they're so big that you don't really know where to start but there's such a collective of us as a profession that can really move those pieces forward. So I'm very excited about that. Fantastic, excellent, thank you. And Yvonne, welcome. Good, uh, I'm gonna say good morning to all of you, but actually it's, uh, early, it's early evening here in, in England in, on a very rainy and a misty and horrible day. Um, just to say thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this wonderful symposium. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I bring you all greetings from the Royal College of Nursing and of course our president uh, Anne-Marie Rafferty. Um, it is my joy uh, to be a nurse and I have been a nurse um, much longer than anybody else on the panel for 43 years. So this is my uh, 43rd year as, as a nurse. I started my nurse training back in 1977 um, and just to say that I am um, coming to the end of my nursing career um, after that time and it has been fantastic and fabulous for, for me to have been a nurse all of those years. And the thing that I suppose really has inspired me um, and driven me is, is nursing in itself, but more than that, nurses. So my focus has been over the last 15 years on the nursing workforce that we have in our National Health Service and looking at what we can do to actually support our nurses to be the best that they can be in order to deliver on high quality patient care, patient safety and patient satisfaction. And we have some highly trained and uh, amazing and wonderful nurses. I mean, I think that now nurses um, are so much better trained than what I trained back in uh, 1977. And they're so much cleverer, I think, at um, coming up with solutions for really difficult and tricky problems. Uh, but I think with, uh, and I can't, can only speak for the English NHS, um, the amount of pressure that uh, goes with the role of being a nurse and the expectations that come with being a nurse, I think that we have a responsibility to look after our nurses, to make them the most valuable commodity that we have in our healthcare system, to promote them, to, uh, to revere them, and to make sure that people recognize and acknowledge what they give back to society. 
And so in order for me to do that, I have been working for the last 10 to 15 years on uh, equality and race equality issues within our NHS. Because if we get it right for one group of nurses, we will get it group right for all groups of nurses. And so that's my, that's my passion and that's um, uh, something I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Excellent. Um, so all of you touched on really important points around, um, I guess, what nursing is all about. So at this point, I'd like to actually shift our focus to the COVID-19 pandemic and what it has opened our eyes to with regards to inequalities and gaps in nursing practice. Starting with you, Vinny, and then Jennifer, I'm wondering if you could speak to the inequalities and gaps in nursing practice, particularly in the area of, you know, starting with the area of clinical acute care and then long-term care sector for you, Jennifer. Um, so, I think, I think one of the biggest worries that we have, because uh, I work at St. Paul's Hospital and it's a very urban hospital and also it has a, it has a um, specializes in really a, um, a very um, marginalized populations. Um, and so one of the, our con biggest concerns in the ICU when we were, this COVID was evolving was we recognized that, you know, while the advice was going out to everybody that you need to socially distance, you need to wash your hands more frequently, um, you need to self-isolate if you have symptoms, those are all things that, you know, and if, if you don't have a secure housing, you, don't, you can't do those yeah. things. Um, and so the, pop, the people who are going to be most vulnerable are the ones that have insecure housing, which, you know, there's a population of that in BC, but there's also um, uh, a housing crisis on many reserves in BC and Canada, um, where, you know, it's more than two or three or four people are living in one house. You have multi-generational families uh, living in one house. You have, uh, and, um, and uh, new immigrants also have multi-generational. So how do you socially isolate? How do you make sure you have access to showering? How do you get to work if you're an essential worker? Those are the people who are most at risk and they're probably also the work that they do is probably the most important work that, are, that keeps our society running. So that was uh, a big concern for us. I think we were a little bit surprised um, unexpectedly and a little bit unprepared with our focus that, you know, this is where it's going to happen, that it ended up happening in long-term care first in BC. Uh, I think it exposed a vulnerability I think we were a little bit blind to. Excellent. And Jennifer, do you want to sort of continue? Sure. Um, so first of all, I want to offer my condolences to anybody who's part of the um, group today who has lost someone close to them in long-term care because we know that at least 80% of Canadians who have died from COVID were living in long-term care homes. And I think, you know, um, it may have surprised some people that uh, long-term care was the area that was hardest hit by the pandemic, but I don't think for people who are in long-term care that it's a surprise. What the pandemic did was really show the inequities at the systemic level and how those inequities then played out um, in terms of people's lives. And so in long-term care, we already had a workforce crisis. We already had very, some very poor architectural uh, buildings um, where people are living with four other people in the same room and don't have access to um, their own washroom and their huge issues around infection control. And we have a crisis around leadership and having that workforce available. So all of these things that were already in existence and also prioritization around um, personal protective equipment where we saw, you know, how we prioritize where that goes and it was not to long-term care. So the sector really had to step up to start to fill those gaps. And in British Columbia, we're fortunate that we had a Minister of Health who understands the sector really well um, and immediately made some really key policy changes. Uh, for example, um, that people could work at one site, but that only works if you have enough people for all those positions at all those sites, and we don't. And so we still have a workforce crisis 
And I think that as we continue along and we're now, you know, entering wave two, we see that um, some of those things that we put in place that we hoped would uh, sort of address some of those inequities as the second wave came are not going to perhaps hold the dike as we had hoped. And so I think we continue to need to focus. The other thing increasingly I think that people you know, who work within long-term care is that we have spent 20 years in a culture change movement. And what's unfortunate is when people from outside of the sector came in, you know, it, with really important work around public health and infection control, a lot of that work around resident-centered care, around philosophies of care like the Eden Alternative, and all of those things that we value and hold dear got pushed out. And people are feeling very much like, um, you know, that all of that work that went into making home-like environments all of a sudden gets pushed back. Mm -hmm. And it's very complex and very challenging. And I think um, we're still working on solutions, particularly around family presence, which has always been a core part of having a home. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I've been deeply impressed with how people in the sector have pulled together, opened the doors to the people that need to come in um, to help to support best practices around infection control. But I think still more needs to be done, for yeah. sure. You, you raised so many important points. I've been just recently looking at some statistics um, from WorkSafe BC regarding the you know, um, number of claims, COVID-related claims that were submitted to WorkSafe. And I learned that probably around 20 to 30% of all claims from all of the industries in BC are from employees in the long-term care sector, which essentially speaks to a lot of those um, inequalities and gaps that you talked about um, in this sector. Um, now I want to sort of turn it over to you, Natasha, and um, sort of ask the same question. Sure. In, in your opinion, what types of gaps and inequalities um, sort of exist in the area of leadership, particularly in the context of nursing? Yeah, it was, it's interesting because in many ways, I think um, from a leadership perspective, we really strengthened our leadership in the province. Um, we, I started meeting weekly at the very beginning of the pandemic with all of the regional chief nursing officers in the province. And we're now meeting weekly again. Um, and I think that as a leadership group, we really tightened our relationships and really were able to be strategic and responsive to what needed to be done in the moment. And I think that was a real sign of just a need and a crisis and stepping up. There's a real workforce planning theme though. I would say uh, one thing that I certainly realized is that, um, that we need the right provider in the right location at the right time. And I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of figuring out the nursing workforce. We have an understanding in broad um, strokes, but I'll give you one example around um, contact tracers, for example, or immunizers, or we need more nurses in critical care. And, you know, I was getting all of, let's train them here and no, we need them over there and we need LPNs here. And, and what is our overarching view of this? What's our overarching strategy? Where do we have gaps? And do nurses need to do all of that? How do we again go back to team-based care? So contact tracing is a good example. Maybe you need one expert nurse with a whole bunch of non-nurses that we can train and we work as a team. So how do we, same with immunizations, how do we start setting up those types of models of care? And I really think again, this is some of the work that we've been doing um, from a leadership perspective in the province is figuring out how do we ensure that those conversations are happening around practice and models of care. And it really reinforced, even though we were able to strengthen um, our relationships as an executive team, but it really reinforced the need for nursing to be at the tables, to have those conversations that really understand the models of care. And I think that for me, a takeaway with the COVID-19 is, is really, um, as we move into a, a longer and longer term phase of it, is really ensuring that nursing leadership is present because we really have that 
that, that strategic vision and we understand practice and we understand models of care. And I think we could really be much more efficient um, from that perspective. So that's really what it highlighted for me. Excellent. Yeah, this issue of, um, you know, first of all, you brought up very um, good points around almost this um, sort of proactive approach and this sort of, um, uh, especially by the leaders in, in the province in terms of, you know, making difficult decisions round the clock, because especially early on when there was quite a bit of uncertainty around, you know, managing the situation. And also this issue of, you know, nursing shortages. It's, it's been long lasting and it's been an issue um, like internationally, nationally, and also provincially. I think I was looking at a study that, um, um, it was a, it's probably an older study, but it said that it was a forecasting study that said by 2022, we're going to be short um, about 60,000 full-time nurses in Canada. And, um, you know, I, I know of other research internationally that has essentially showed similar results in terms of um, nursing shortages. And I'd like to sort of come back to this point uh, during our next questions, if that's okay. Yeah. So I want to sort of now shift the question to you, Yvonne. Um, what are your experiences in, in, in terms of gaps and equalities in the area of leadership? Gosh, it's a, it's a really good question, actually. Um, so when we first uh, went into lockdown um, back in March in, in England, um, I don't think anybody expected the situation to spiral out of control as quickly as it did. And um, what happened was that we began to see very, very quickly, actually, um, our clinicians, uh, doctors and nurses from um, non-white backgrounds dying very, very quickly uh, and disproportionately from, from COVID. So everybody went into a flat spin and a real panic about what we needed to do about it. And that's where leadership needed to uh, really step up and take responsibility because people were frightened. There was a lot of fear in, in our nursing workforce. And what, um, what somebody was saying earlier, I can't remember who it was who said it, was that, uh, that actually, you know, we really do need to look after our, our nurses as senior leaders. And in that situation, what, ha what happened was that most nurses from non-white, so in, in England, we have 20% of our nursing workforce um, and we have you know, nearly 750,000 nurses um, from non-white backgrounds. I mean, the, the English NHS is actually staffed by uh, people from all over the world and mostly they are at, um, the patient bedside so they are at a uh, field level as you as we call it and i think that the issue was that was that there was so much fear and anxiety not only for them and what was happening with them with the lack of um, personal protective equipment but also the fact that in the communities that they came from people were not were not um surviving this 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 pandemic and lots of people were getting sick so for for senior leaders there was something about well what do we do about this and how do we go about doing it really quickly to make sure that we keep our nursing staff safe to make sure that they're not as frightened um, and i i don't know about about you guys but we had lots of shortages of, of ppe and we had people going off sick and we had i mean it was, the whole thing was pandemonium and what our chief nurse uh, for England did was bring a group of people together, senior nurses together. And we actually talked about how we were going to make sure that all of our staff understood that they were our key priority. And you will have heard that, you know, uh, England and, and the United Kingdom all came together and every Thursday night, everybody went outside and they were clapping for the NHS and saying how brilliant and wonderful and marvellous people were. But on the ground, it was about making sure that staff had the adequate equipment that they needed to be able to do the work they needed to do. And also that they actually had managers to go to to support them and help them and do the risk assessment that was necessary and needed for them to be able to, to continue doing the job that they were doing. Um, so it was really very, very difficult then. And it is becoming increasingly difficult now as we go into the second wave. 
Excellent. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, we did have similar sort of issues and problems in BC with respect to um, you know, access to um, necessary supplies and equipment like PPEs, as you said. Um, so essentially all of you raised really valuable points regarding the gaps and inequalities that were essentially almost exacerbated or brought into surface as a result of the pandemic. Um, now I wanna sort of um, you know, explore this idea of nursing trying to fill and address these inequalities and gaps. So starting with you, Vinny, in the area of um, nursing practice, how have nurses tried to fill uh, the inequalities in nursing practice or in practice in general? Oh, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, one, because uh, it, it, I think it really demonstrates the, the nature of what, critical, what nursing is, um, is um, when this pandemic hit and, and we had to like not allow visitors to come in or only allow visitors in the most extreme situations. And in ICU, everything's an extreme situation. So it broke our heart to say no to people. Um, and we did have patients die where their family weren't able to come in. We did transfer people from the floor to the ICU in the middle of the night and their family couldn't be in. And, and this was happening, I think, two o'clock in the morning, early in March, when everything was just, the rules were all changing. And um, the CCOT nurse, the critical care outreach team nurse, pulled out her personal phone and said, you, we were gonna take you to the ICU. Um, you talk to your wife right now. You hear, you can FaceTime her, here's my phone, just use it. Um, so that happened at two o'clock in the morning. This patient talked to their loved one before they got transferred to the ICU, horrendously scary, not knowing what, to, what they were gonna go into. Um, the, we had a new nurse just starting, just finished her BCIT program, just started. And with BCIT, you get an iPad, it's an electronic textbook. So she had an extra iPad and she heard this story and she said, you know what, I was gonna sell this iPad, but I'm donating it to the ICU. Wow. And by the next day, the foundation heard this story and they bought six iPads for critical care. And um, you know, before that, when, when families came in, like 40%, 30 to 40% of our families that come to the ICU don't live in the lower mainland. So they're coming from someplace else. And usually not everybody's coming, just who can, right? And um, before that, we used to say, okay, well, you know, you can talk on a phone, but we're not sure about privacy and security. And we have open bed. Policy. And we had all these rules about how you couldn't do it. And with the flip of a switch, we had six iPads and uh, we navigated those, the confidentiality and privacy stuff quickly because we didn't want people to be separated from their families. If we couldn't let them in, at least we could do this. So I think that speaks to how quickly, at two o'clock in the morning, how quickly nurses will just find the solution, implement the solution and spread it. The other thing that uh, came out of this is we tweeted and we shared and we connected with clinicians, not just in our ICU, but ICUs across the country, across the province, uh, ac uh, across the nation. Like I, I tweet with people from Italy now um, and shared our innovations and that idea gets spread very, very quickly. Wow. Uh, another one is this. So we wear a mask all day long and it's an, it de, I see is dehumanizing to begin with. And then you put a mask on everybody so you can't see anyone. This was an idea, I don't even know where on Twitter I found it, but some other country, some other person said, you know what, why don't you just get a, your face? And so at least they can see who you are. And that got implemented, not just in our hospital, but in many hospitals across the world. So it's in this idea that gets shared from clinician to clinician, uh, which I don't think we did before COVID to this extent. Mm -hmm. that, that's really fantastic. And I mean, fantastic. And I mean, Jennifer could probably speak to this a bit more, but in my study and in the long-term care sector, essentially around the impact of COVID-19, we've been hearing very similar stories from nurses stepping up to sort of fill in the gap for um, all of these strict visitation policies that were put in place to slow the spread of the virus um, and sort of providing that emotional social care to residents, spending time with them, you know, coming to the facility on their own time to paint uh, the resident's nail or spend time with them or read, you know, a story for them or something. Jennifer, uh, now I want to sort of turn it to you and say um, in, in, you know, long-term care sector, uh, do you have any stories to share in, in terms of how nurses have tried to fill in the gap? And I mean, this is not a question on our list, but no, it's I'm not. Really... So I have a prepared answer. <laughs> I put you on the spot. Um, you know, I think I'm going to just pick up two things that Benny makes me think of, and it's responsiveness and transformation. And I think that you know, 
in nursing, um, those are two sort of professional characteristics that we have. And um, nurses are problem solvers. And so I did have some directors of care reaching out to me early on in the pandemic around some of the challenges they were having around PPE and, um, you know, the things that were never going to happen that all of a sudden are happening and we're writing up protocols and we're transforming care in the moment in response to pandemic. So I think certainly in long term care, um, people are used <laughs> to doing what they can with very little and that continued. And I'm really impressed with, you know, how the sector has, it, you know, e implemented responses around the infection control protocols that now have to be in place in a space where for a long time we said these are people's homes and we're not, you know, doing particular things. So I think, yes, in many ways at, you know, individual sites, nurses are responding, they're transforming care and doing what they can in the moment to make sure that people are still getting what they need. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And now I want to sort of go back to the question on our list. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so how have nurses tried to fill in the gap in education? Yeah, and so I have thought about this one a little bit, and I think it's the same. <laughs> like I just, I look at us, the diversity on the panel, and I know that um, in so many ways, uh, you know, all of those nursing things that we do to problem solve um, is what we're doing. And so, you know, literally Friday, afternoon getting an email saying as of monday your class is online faculty transforming um as best they could and then taking a very brief interlude even in the undergraduate program because we've talked about workforce issues you know nur new nurses cannot stop graduating absolutely the system needs as many mm -hmm. nurses so i am just in awe of my colleagues in how um you know everyone comes together in a crisis to say how are we going to make this work what do we need to do and really um continuing on almost without taking a longer longer break than a big breath uh, and for our students to be so flexible and adaptive i think is also needs to be recognized because here's people coming into intensive nursing programs expecting um, to be, uh, you know, paced at a certain rate and all of a sudden they're already learning that nursing, sometimes that bell goes off and everything changes and you have to pivot. And I'm so deeply impressed with them as well. Um, and those are really important skills. And then I, I don't want to forget all the educators out in practice and how they had plans too for what they were going to teach and educate and all of the new um, materials they had to come up with and even that teaching at the bedside that nurses do. I think we need to think of, you know, that broad spectrum of education that nurses are involved in. And I think nurses have been leading, you know, that public messaging around um, the pandemic and what people need to do and how we can support them through this. Fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer. Now I want to sort of turn the invisible mic over to Natasha and ask the same question with respect to policy, given your role in the ministry of how have nurses tried to fill the gap in um, policy? Yeah, so I was going to pick up on what Benny said too around you need leaders to be able to be supportive of that mm -hmm. adaptive practice, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do in the ministry right now is collect all the good things that we did and were responsive in that should remain. Um, and students is a good example because the same thing happened to me where I kept, we were getting emails going, we're shutting down practicums. And then at the same time, I'm getting all these emails saying, we need nurses everywhere. So I'm like, we, we cannot do this. We need a strategy. We need to figure it out. So we developed a policy and a student guideline to both the post-secondary institutions, all the educate, all the educational facilities that are educating all the nursing designations as well as ministry, as well as the health authorities where they're placed because things like PPE was coming up and can they be here and all of those sorts of questions, just really trying to say, look, 
we are a system and we need students to keep going and we're going to have to adapt. It can't be the way we were doing it before, but we need to get these students graduating. We need them out in a safe manner. So student practice is a great example. The other example um, is scope, is thinking about scope. And are we actually supporting all of the nursing designations to, to work to full scope in a safe way? And one thing that we're currently working on in ministry right now, and this isn't, it's a bit related to COVID, but this is more about the overdose crisis that has worsened substantially because of COVID. So now we're looking at there's a real need for prescribing and access to OAT, um, opioid agonist treatment. So we are now looking at RN prescribing, and I know Yvonne, you have experience with this in the UK. Um, so we're moving forward with that. That's a good thing to move forward with in the system and to look at how do we do this in a safe way? And again, you know, sometimes when it depends on the audience and who you're with, sometimes it's like, oh, it's, that's the Wild West, you know, you're crazy, what are you thinking, are I prescribing, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to do it in a team-based supportive environment, right? These RNs are expert in their fields. They are working in these areas, they're working with experts that are working as teams, and this really increases access. So how do we write that supportive policy that ensures all of those supports are in place such that they can work to full scope. So that's just one example. There's other policies that we've moved forward with as well around LPN scope and um, a whole host of other areas. But those were two key ones for me that were real highlights of, of let's keep this going. This is good for nursing and this is good for patients. So those would be two examples for me. Excellent. And I mean, I completely I agree that uh, some of these strategies, almost like human resource optimization strategies totally. around scope and team-based care delivery, they're so yep. much linked that yep. you cannot essentially accomplish yep. one without another. Yep. Um, now, I'm going to sort of turn it over to you, Yvonne, and ask the same question with respect to leadership. Yeah, so, so from our perspective, I think that uh, leadership has absolutely had to be the key thing that we, um, I don't want to say promoted, but, but highlighted during this pandemic. It was, it was essential that nurses felt led, that they had people who were um, responsible for them who were accountable for making sure that it all stacked up and um, across the whole of the piece we have uh, many senior nurses who who were really putting themselves uh, I would say on the line to make sure that their workforce their nursing workforce felt that they could um, and, and should uh, be delivering that, that high quality patient care and patient safety. It was a really very, very tricky and very difficult time. And I think that we, uh, as, as nurse leaders, got together and decided how we were going to be working with our, our nursing workforce. There were more webinars and uh, Zoom and team meetings than you could shake a stick at, trying to make sure that uh, staff felt that they were, were well supported during that, that difficult, difficult time. And I, I, I often, often felt that, you know, the leaders are leading and who's supporting and the leaders because uh, the way it worked was that we have, we have uh, chief nurses and it kind of like the buck stops up there and, and our chief nurse is accountable uh, through to the ministers and it was a, a very difficult time, let's just, just say that, uh, for, for her to make sure that the nursing voice was heard and that we were making sure through the RCN, through uh, the general secretary, that people understood that we had to take care of our nurses uh, and that without them, that we wouldn't be able to do what we needed to do for our, for our population. So leadership was, was nursing leadership particularly was put right at the forefront uh, to the point that our chief nurse was constantly on the TV alongside the um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson and the medical director um, to show not only the country but, but other nurses that nurses, nursing and nurses were leading from the front. So I think that you know uh, from where I'm sitting now nursing and nurses have been promoted inadvertently as part of this this pandemic and and it has shown 
that nurse leadership is absolutely essential and necessary to ensuring that the patients um, get exactly what they need in terms of care. Excellent. I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of um, almost like this need for healthy nurses, which is, again, I think uh, according to what you said, Natasha, I think it's a, a human resource optimization technique. Yeah. Needing healthy nurses to be able to provide effective patient care and doing their best at the bedside. I mean, I just recently um, conducted a province-wide study of DC nurses that showed there was almost a 10% rise in um, mental health problems among VC nurses. You know, we found like uh, rates of depression, anxiety, um, emotional exhaustion, which is essentially an indicator of burnout. All of these rates were almost like higher by 10% within the span of six months because this was a longitudinal study. Now I want to sort of go to you, Natasha, because of your role and your sort of expertise in leadership and policy. Um, where do you see research opportunities for nursing? So team-based care for sure. I think mm -hmm. that we need to step in and um, lead the way in terms of what that could and should look like with all professionals, right? And, and bring all professionals um, on board to the relational care that we are so expert at. So I think that um, and relational care with patients and other providers that we work with, right? So that, that kind of care. Um, and then I think workforce planning. Like, I really think that we need to continue on. There's so many expert researchers in this area, um, Yvonne included. And I think that we need to really, we need to do better at this, I think. And I think that there's a real opportunity for us as a profession to look at the future, which is not hard to see, right? The need that there's going to be in long-term care, you know, a whole host of areas, the overdose crisis, there's just, it's endless, uh, and really try and predict and maneuver and ensure that we're training, educating, supporting um, nurses where they need to be, and that we're supporting them to lead teams and that we're really thinking about who needs to be where. Um, and be prepared for that. So those would be the two key areas I think that nursing research in particular uh, has a real role to play. Perfect, thank you. Um, anybody else want to sort of speak to the research opportunities? I want to um, sort of keep it open. Um, um, I, I have, thank you for saying that because that's totally in my head all the time now. <laughs> so I get to say something different. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in critical care, that we tend to focus on, 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 on getting to 28 days. Did, are you alive at 28 right. days? Great. Um, and right now we have a huge population of people who um, are surviving COVID, which is great, but they're surviving. This is a novel disease. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they're going to be surviving with. And the, the research that has come out about ICU survivorship is that a lot of ICU patients are not doing great once they leave the ICU. Um, they are leaving with a variety of problems. They're leaving with post-traumatic stress disorder and sleep disturbances that can last up to a year. They're leaving with cognitive decline, so they don't get to go back to work, which means they're going to have an economic hit because of that. Um, and I think, there's, I think we were in critical care. We were learning that we really needed to cr create some sort of post-ICU uh, team-based care that followed them beyond the community because we weren't leaving them uh, going back to their lives 100%. I'm hoping that with COVID and we, uh, with this you know, huge need of um, um, COVID survivors that we really push the dial on what that post-ICU survivorship is and how do we wrap around care after the ice too, so they go back to the best life that they can go back to. And Jennifer. Yeah, I think um, what we can see is nursing research potential is very, very broad. <laughs> yeah. I think um, for my own work and for many others, it's continuing to look at the lived experience of vulnerable populations through the pandemic. So the impact on those who may not have had COVID, but are impacted by it um, in a myriad of ways. So I've I'm doing a study around um, the experiences of children with medical complexity and their families. And these are high users of the healthcare system um, who have been seriously impacted by decreases in health services and education, social services, uh, but they haven't had COVID. 
but they're going to be experiencing uh, the ripple effect of the pandemic for years to come. And also the lived experience of families in long-term care and in our dementia community out in the community where we've seen things like adult daycare programs close, um, a decline in home support for a variety of reasons. And so I think it is sort of that uh, really holistic look at the, at the impact of the pandemic on society, on people's health and well-being over time is a really important place for nurses because I think nurses walk alongside people on that journey. And I think also um, are uniquely positioned to hear those stories from people. Uh, and so, um, and to impact practice and to impact at the systems level. So I think in those ways, we have uh, responsibility and um, to be engaging in that kind of research to really bring forth those other kinds of experiences that people might not know a lot about. I completely I agree, given, you know, the different um, roles that nursing can take, I think that the opportunities for research are really diverse. Now I want to sort of, sort of turn it to you, Yvonne. Um, what do you think are the research opportunities out there, given the pandemic? so many research opportunities for nurses at the moment i think it's um it's 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 bizarre really um that we have had to have a pandemic like this to to show um you know the importance of research um and particularly nursing research and nurses actually doing research so at the moment we are um doing lots and lots of work on um the impact of covid on you know all sorts of communities and patients and nurses are at the forefront of that and i was at a meeting recently uh, at king's college um, university hospital where nurses are actually taking the lead in looking at how uh, who and how people who have had covid are, are coping with and dealing with that in terms of long covid um, which is the, the impact uh, of COVID after, technically after you're supposed to be better. Um, and what does that mean for, for community nurses um, and how that's going to impact on our community nurses in terms of the numbers of people that are going to continue to be need, needed to be seen and, and what it means in terms of physio and so on and so forth. And nurses are taking, you know, the responsibility for, for leading on that work. And I I think it's, it's, it's wonderful that, that you know, nurses are doing that, um, but it, 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 it's, it's obtuse and it's, um, it's, it's strange that it's taken this for people to see that nurses are researchers too. They're not just about you know, being at the bedside and mopping people's brow and doing all the rest of it. They're actually really quite academic and, and wanting to find solutions, as somebody said earlier, to quite complex and difficult issues and problems. So in, in that sense, I mean, I think we were, I'm, I'm really proud of, of how nurses have stepped up into the research space, obviously, because you know, we know that nurses have been researchers forever, um, but it's visible now, so much visible, more visible than it was before. And I think that's wonderful. Excellent. I think I completely agree with your point. Um, you know, COVID-19 brought to surface all of these already existing issues, but it also, sort of uh, um, shone a light on nursing and what nursing is all about. So that, thank you for that excellent point. So, you know, as all of you know, 2020 is the year of the nurse and midwife, and it was recently extended by the World Health Organization until 2021. And, you know, it's been a really unprecedented year for nurses and midwives internationally. So as we move closer to 2021, what gives you hope in our um, near future? And I want to start with you, Yvonne, uh, given your expertise in uh, workforce planning and management. I, I, I think that there has to be hope <laughs> um, going forward. And I think it, it, we are responsible for ensuring that there is that, that hope. Um, by actually leading our workforce and, and saying to our, to our workforce, this is something that, you know, we will get through together. Um, we will support you to the best of our ability. We have at the moment um, 45,000 nursing vacancies here, which is, you know, quite a substantial number 
of, 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 of people um, that aren't in these nursing posts. We have to, we have to make sure that people understand the importance of nursing and the value of nursing so that people will want to come into nursing, even at this really difficult time. And what's happening at the moment, and it's, 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 it's a very interesting thing, and I'm not 100% sure it would have happened had it not been for COVID. People who would not have thought of nursing as a career are now coming to think of nursing as a career for all sorts of reasons, not least because of the way things are panning out with the economy and some people are, are not able to find jobs in, in the area that they've been looking in and, and, and they feel that they want to give something back and so on and so forth. So I, I, I think that, you know, going forward and particularly uh, in, in the year of the, the, the nurse and the midwife, I get told off for this by midwives, by the way, they tell me I should say the nurse, the year of the midwife and the nurse. So I sort of switch it up a bit. Um, but, actually, but, but actually, I think that we need to, uh, globally, because there is a global nursing shortage, we need to all start um, talking up nursing um, and actually saying that, that, that we are an important and very uh, necessary commodity worldwide and that we are here to support and help our populations to have better healthcare. So we need to put that hope into uh, the system because at the moment, um, to, be, to be honest, um, it is, it's, 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 it's not, I wouldn't say it's not hopeful, but there's a lot of feeling of despondency and despair within our system. And I think that we need to, as nurse leaders, uh, policy makers and so on, start talking in a way that's going to actually actively encourage people to want to come into nursing to, and to stay in nursing. So, yeah. I, I completely agree with you. I, I mean, I've been looking at over the past several years that, you know, I've started my uh, sort of uh, establishing my research program. Um, I've been interested in this whole issue of nursing shortages and health human resource optimization. Now, I've been looking at quite a bit of research evidence that essentially establishes this link between um, inadequate staffing levels, nursing shortages, poor, um, at, like poor patient outcomes, like patient adverse events, things like falls, medication errors, and things like that happening, and also um, you know, negative outcomes for, for the nurses themselves, things like burnout and job uh, dissatisfaction, turnover. And um, on top of that, um, organizational outcomes, higher levels of costs associated with, you know, educating nurses and recruiting new nurses and sort of bringing them in to fill in the gap in uh, sort of uh, nurses who leave their position. So I wanna now sort of ask the same question of you, Natasha, again, because of your expertise in policy and leadership, what gives you hope? Yeah, so I, it's, uh, I'm glad you asked me next because I wanted to build on what Yvonne had said is around the recognition piece. I, I think that this is the time to harness that. I, I think that there is a real recognition for the value um, and the need uh, that we as a population depend on the nursing profession. Uh, and I think that we need to keep on that momentum. And that gives me a lot of hope because I think it's really great to finally get some of that recognition. Not that it was never there before, but I think there is a real swelling now of, yes, we are dependent um, for our healthcare on nursing professions. So how do we support that? So I think that's one thing that gives me hope. You know, the other, the other piece that gives me hope is nursing is the largest profession in the workforce, in the healthcare system, right? So there is power in numbers um, from a professional perspective. And I look at all nursing designations in this. And I think that not only are we the largest workforce in the healthcare system, we also are um, the connectors. We also work um, as colleagues with all the other healthcare professionals more than any other singular profession, right? And similarly with patients, we work with a whole diverse in, uh, types of patients with different illnesses um, and wellness. And we also work in a whole um, host of different areas in the healthcare system. So because of that, it, we as a profession have a lot to contribute and the value is very clear. And I think that the more we can really demonstrate that, and again, 
be part of those conversations, set that policy, drive the policy, lead the research discussion, lead the models of care discussions. I think we're just we're only going to benefit as a profession. And I'm very hopeful to the future because of that. I think COVID has unearthed a lot of positive things that the nursing profession brings as well. Thank you. Excellent. Um, what gives you hope? Um, so I, I spent a lot of time in hospital. I know people said that you should, you know, stay away and if you could socially, but there really, it was all hands on deck in the intensive care units across BC. Um, and uh, we had networks between intensive care units, you know, um, usually you know, physician to physician, scientist to scientist, academic networks, and maybe some leadership networks, but not so much the clinician to clinician. Um, and what COVID uh, did is, is really um, create that clinician to clinician connections. So now uh, if you go to Twitterverse, there's like, I can talk to nurses in Italy and, and, and I have friends in the US and I can, I can problem solve with a much bigger group of um, ICU nurses. Um, and that has been groundbreaking. It has saved me so many things. I have solved problems because everyone else has been talking about it on Twitter or on a critical care network of some sort. Um, and so that has been really exciting to really recognize that, you know, this wonderful team that I get to work with is not just in my ICU, it's in every ICU. And the other thing that gives me hope is I have, I, I, I've been exhausted. I have been in tears on some days, um, but I have been incredibly inspired by the people I work with. The, you know, we asked nurses to walk into a very uncertain situation and they were scared for sure, but they stepped forward in unison, they step forward. We asked nurses to, you know, I, you know, we might be short of ICU nurses. Could we get nurses who didn't have ICU training to come into the ICU and just help us out? And it's scary. I know what it is to be a BCIT student. I taught BCIT. It's scary your first day in the ICU. And we had people who never went through training who stepped forward and said, yes, we'll give you a hand. We'll figure it out as we go. And I think it is, it is my greatest joy to be able to work in that environment with those people. Excellent. I, I, again, I completely agree. I think nurses um, are a great of support for one another. Again, in my research, my recent research related to COVID, um, this province-wide study of BC nurses, we actually found that an overwhelming majority of our nurses in, in the province said that the rela their relationships with their nursing colleagues, as well as the interdisciplinary team that they were working with had improved during COVID-19, essentially suggesting that they, they were relying on each other's support to get through this crisis and manage the pandemic. And now I wanna sort of uh, ask you, Jennifer, mm -hmm. to talk about your hopes and- Yeah, I um, think in terms of nursing leadership, um, you know, what makes me feel really hopeful is our students. And what uh, I'm really excited about is anticipating the fall term, we were concerned that we would not be able to fill our classes because people would be so busy in practice. And these are our graduate classes. And in fact, they ended up oversubscribed. And we have full classes in health policy and nursing leadership. And that makes me so hopeful because when I talk with our students, um, they say that part of what the pandemic has opened their eyes to is how much uh, we need a nurse at that table and how valuable nursing leadership is and they really see that and it's so much more visible now and um, I'm deeply impressed with people who are working and going to graduate school at the same time and I think this is the time if you've been considering you know coming back to school and pursuing a graduate degree in nursing with the increased visibility with the growing appreciation for nursing's role in our healthcare system and beyond um, I think that the opportunities for nursing leaders are incredible and um, it's really about choosing your path because there will be one for you. So I'm excited and I'm hopeful when I work with our students and see where they're going because they're going places. <laughs> I completely agree. We do have a great uh, cohort of really high achievers students in our program. So thank you all of you. Now I want to sort of open it up to the audience for some questions. We already have a few questions listed, so I'm just going to read them out to you. So our first um, question is many panelists have spoken about the important work of nurses, but the work of nurses often um, goes unrecognized and is undervalued. 
Although COVID has highlighted the importance of nurses' work, it remains to be seen whether this admiration will be sustained post-pandemic. How can we change this? This is a question from our Kristen Haas. Does anybody want to sort of... I can, I can, I can I'm sure. going to tell you just from my perspective. Um, uh, so we have, all, I said, we always had critical care networks that talk to each other. We had academics talk to each other and we had physician groups that talk to each other, but we didn't have that clinician to clinician one. Um, I am in the, in the past nine months, I have been asked to be sit on so many more tables yeah. that I have ever been asked to that, like I knew that they existed. I knew they talked about important stuff, but I was not at that table. And now it's like, oh, well, we need you here. And what do you think? And I have to very quickly figure out what I think, but um, I, I am at those tables now and I'm not, I don't think I'm gonna vacate that seat. I'm not gonna give it back. So I think once we show up there and we show that we pro solve the problem, then the people go, oh yeah, you do need to be at this table. And I think, so I think we're gonna see a big change in that respect. Anyway, and I, I would say keep up the visibility, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think, I, like panels like this, um, going on Twitter, these are the things I do in my practice. These are the differences that I'm making. Present, write up what you're doing in your clinic, go to conferences, like do all of those. Like I think the more everybody can do a part in that. And, and honestly, it's just sharing your stories. This is what I'm passionate about. This is why I went into nursing. All of those things add up and they make a real difference. And I think the more visible we are, the more public speaking we do about it, um, the more research, you know, we're able to kind of say, this is where um, nurses are. Um, this is the difference they're making across the board. And there's a whole host of, you know, documents and websites to help us articulate that. So I think just keep up the visibility. Um, and I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Fantastic. Yeah, I would just add, uh, building on what you said, I think um, nursing's and this is in relation to the media even, like one of the challenges in nursing is that um, often nurses can't go and speak to the media uh, because of protocols with their employers. And so one of the promises I made to myself at the beginning of this pandemic was that I'm usually media shy. And I said, I will say yes when people ask me. And I've done a couple things and it's been really interesting for me because I've had nurses from across Canada reach out to me and say, I was so happy to see a nurse on the news. Um, that was so important yep. to me to see a nurse in the public eye. And so I think um, I just encourage people to say yes when that call comes, because mm -hmm. I think that's part of the visibility. I'm on Twitter a lot. You can tweet all you want, but, you know, being on CBC News apparently is <laughs> also a pretty big deal. <laughs> so um, I think I just encourage people who have that, nurses who are able to be in the public eye, be in the Do public that. eye. Yeah. Say yes when you're asked. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good point. Um, Yvonne? I absolutely agree with all of that. I think that the, you know, in trying to keep our profile high is, uh, is key to, to all of this. I mean, this is an opportunity for us as nurses to show who we are, what we do, and how we go about doing it. And that we can, um, you know, as one of the, the, uh, the, the other panelists say, has uh, said, you know, be out in, in the media, um, speak up on the news. I mean, uh, many of us nurses in the UK have been on the news a lot. You know, the General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing, myself as the Deputy President, uh, the, the, the President herself, constantly talking about the importance of nurses and nursing, um, raising our profile by writing, raising our profile by just making our voices heard. And uh, I think the question, question was a really, really good one because we know that for a long, 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 long time, our nurses have been undervalued uh, and not appreciated. Um, and you know that that shows up in, in in what we are remunerated. It shows up in the way we are treated, and and so on and so forth. And there is not a never-ending supply of nurses. You know, it's we're finite, and we know that because we know that there are these shortages. So we have to promote ourselves and promote ourselves to the world, so they appreciate and value who we are and what we do. Excellent. Um, just. Um... For the sake of time, I want to get right to our second question. Um, so this person says that they're interested in any comments related to the long-term effects in mental health and the 
psychological trauma experienced by all patients in society in general. How will we as nurses protect our reserves and help support the resilience of the public and patients? Yeah. Anyone want, wants to comment? It's a, it's a great question, actually, because it's, it's so uh, relevant and pertinent at the moment, protecting your mental health and your physical health. You know, your, it, it, it is, it, it, it's imperative. And during lockdown, it has been a really difficult and tricky time for lots and lots of people, not least our nursing workforce. And keeping your mental health, uh, keeping yourself healthy is, is got to be one of your top priorities. And I speak to nurses a lot who are saying, yes, but I've got to do this and I've got to go to work and I have to look after the family and I have to do this. And it's about making sure that you're okay so they can be okay. So, so finding time for yourself and, and lots of employers now are working in incredibly hard about wellness and making sure that people acknowledge that you know taking regular exercise making sure that you eat well making sure that you rest is really important they're really i mean it sounds trite and trivial but they're really important things for people to remember particularly if you're a nurse on a 12-hour shift in ITU or if you are actually out in the community looking after patients and you're you know you you got your PPE on and all the rest of it looking after yourself and your mental health has got to be your top priority as opposed to looking after your patients and then looking after your own mental health because if something happens to you it means that you are out of the uh, out of the service and it, it's not helpful. So we're really pushing hard for nurses to really care for themselves. Very and I good. have to say, I completely I agree with you. It's like this whole idea of putting uh, your own mm -hmm. oxygen mask first and then Absolutely. sort of continuing with your business. Um, so our third question is, um, so this person wants, I think this is probably a question for you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, elaborate on the psychosocial, spiritual resilience, etc., components related to person family centered care, the short and long term care effects, and nursing role. Oh, sorry, the short and long term effects and nursing role. So, elaborate on the psychosocial components related to person and family centered care, the short and long term effects and nursing role. I don't quite understand okay. the question, but I'll maybe. give it a shot. Do you give it a shot? You might want to jump in too, because I don't know if it's specific to long term care. I think, um, you know, in terms of person and family centered care, it's really around providing the care that's meaningful for that individual within the long term care context. And, um, you know, part of that for many people is having their family and friends present in their home. And one of the great challenges, and you've talked about this in the context of the ICU, and certainly in long-term care homes, this has been uh, a very tragic outcome of a necessary infection control protocol to um, close those doors to visitors for a time. And in the short term, it's been traumatic for people. There are physical and mental consequences for people's well-being. Um, in terms of loneliness and social isolation for people who are cognitively impaired with dementia in particular, imagine, you know, having to be even Absolutely. in a room by yourself and not understanding potentially what that is. And so I think like all of the things with long COVID, this is what partly we'll be monitoring as researchers. And I know leaders will be implementing whatever they can to meet the socio-emotional needs of residents um, and people who live in long-term care homes and also their family members are desperate. You know, families have such a critical role um, as partners in care for frail older people. And there's a gap there. And um, we're still looking at what, what those consequences are, but they are devastating. So I can speak in the short term, I think, lots of concern around loneliness and social isolation and in the long term people are very concerned that that will lead to people's premature death and so we need to be adapting our infection control protocols and we have been to make sure that family and friends can be present 
Uh, we still need more resources for that, but like everything, even the policy changes, you don't necessarily have the people to fill those roles. Exactly. You don't necessarily have the PPE to um, provide. So I think we still are full steam ahead on working on all of those aspects of care to make sure that people can be together again in the way that they want and choose to be. Yeah. And I don't know if there's, I mean, I think your um, examples from ICU are tremendous in how quickly practice transformed mm -hmm. and yeah. um yeah i think in in the icu we know it's a time of crisis and, and it's that and it's the relational work that's really yeah. exciting about icu as well um and so we we just had to figure something else out if we couldn't bring them this way uh, we have to figure something else out um and I'm, and I'm a little bit shocked that, you know, with 40% of our patients not living in the lower mainland that we didn't figure this out sooner because we put that burden on them to come down here for right. decades beforehand. And now why, why did we do that to people? Um, I think uh, resiliency and, 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 and psychological safety and mental, and, and mental well-being, it starts as the nurse. Um, so doing small things like thanking each other, um, like, um, fussing about the break room to make sure there's enough places to sit and places to drink and creating more break rooms so people can have a place to go. Um, there was a great project that uh, VGH had done called the Wobble Room. So you can kind of go and talk to someone about the stress of the day and the moment. Um, simple things like doing debriefs after a code blue, just to kind of help rebuild and support that resiliency. I think uh, one of the things that I've, I've shifted on and many people have shifted on is, you know, we don't need to be top A1 competitive all the time. We could just focus on making sure we're okay. And then, you know, just socialize the ideas. You don't have to, you know, win at soccer. You don't have to get an A in math. Uh, you just have to be okay. And that's good enough. And, and, that, and be proud of that. Especially in, in the light of the recent crisis. I think that that's an important point. So we do have a couple more questions and only about 10 minutes. So I really want to sort of get to these two questions. We have a question um, from Reluca that says, while we face the ongoing challenges that the pandemic is posing on all of us, how do we also equally focus our energy towards building more resilient health systems mm -hmm. that are supportive of nurses and welcoming of their expertise? <laughs> Uh, that's the trick, right? Is that balance. We're in a pandemic, but we also have a whole host of other policies that we've been trying to move forward and we are moving forward and we're working on it. So do we grow our team? Do we um, be more effective and more efficient in the work that we are doing? Which I think sometimes, sometimes you realize after the fact that there were better ways to do things. And maybe it actually isn't about growing the team and having more people to move policy forward. Maybe it's actually, you know, having more community-based meetings around what needs to be done. And just, again, thinking more how to work more effectively and, and more smartly really is, I think, what, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle to, to, to do everything. And I think you just have to kind of constantly be balancing um, that, yeah. Anybody else, Yvonne, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's a real a trick to balance all the things that we have to, to have to do during the pandemic and to keep everything else going as well. It's, it, it's, it's all consuming, isn't it? The pandemic, but actually life goes on and other, other things are going on as well. And uh, the expectation is that you're able to do them all. And it is um, making sure that you um, are able to, to, to balance what's important and what's not so important and maybe letting some things go as agreed with others because at the end of the day we cannot do it all we, we can only do what we can do and uh, you know the expectations on us are incredibly high as it stands so it's it's that it's that balance and making decisions collectively about what what we're in business to do, what's important now, and what we're going to be focusing on. And it might mean that some things are left, but, but we, we really do have to own that we cannot do it all. We just can't. Yeah, and nurses are great at prioritization, <laughs> I think. I mean, um, you know, this is one of the skills that we learn as students to be able to sort of identify those important um, nursing competencies or nursing activities that needs to be done right away. Um, yeah. What about you, Jennifer and Vinny? Anything 
you guys want to add? Well, I think for me, I think uh, there was the first wave of we've never done this before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Um, and now we're sort of into that long haul time. And so those uh, systems level priorities that were set aside or were lost, as many happen in long term care, I think now trying to creep those back onto the agenda, uh, but at the same time prioritizing them. I mean, for the first time almost in my career, I've had to say no to things, which was really hard for me because I think as nurses, uh, there's something to do, you do it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't change when you're working in the academy. I think you're still, oh, that needs to be done. Um, so I think, you know, we need to start looking at how do we prioritize? How do we collectively also decide, you know, what are those priorities? So I think I agree these conversations are so important to think about, you know, as a profession, what do we collectively want to move forward at this time, knowing that we can't do all of the things that we are on our wish list. Some of them have to stay on the wish list. They'll come back again. But what, what can we focus on right now? The same idea of prioritization. Yeah, absolutely. Many? Yeah, I, I can tell you that I've definitely been overwhelmed many a day. Um, before this pandemic, my week was, I'm going to take on the world. By Wednesday, I was going to fail at everything. And by Friday, I got 80% of it done. That's my week before this pandemic. And it's just on steroids now. Um, my mantra when things get that, when we're living in this, this thing that we're going to be living in for a while, my mantra is just solve one problem at a time. Like you don't have to fix everything, but solve the problem in front of you um, and listen to the people who have ideas and steal shamelessly ideas mm -hmm. and share every little trick you figure out. Yeah. Um, and if you keep doing that, it may not feel like you're going forward, but you are going forward. Like we can't be excellent, but better is always possible and yeah. just aim for better. Exactly. And I mean, this, this is a really important um, sort of practice and change management and change management theory make change little changes and steps you don't have to turn the situation upside down like you know you don't have to wait for that perfect perfect intervention you can just make small changes changes and small improvements now i want to get to our last question from dr sally thorne um, so okay. Yvonne has emphasized the vital role of strong nursing leadership. Canada's lack of a chief nursing officer seems a particular challenge for us now, as does the interdisciplinarity that has made it difficult to visibly lead nurses across our health authorities. How can we work in this country to ensure that we rebuild a strong system of visible nursing leadership across our healthcare system? Which is a really excellent question. Yvonne's going to tell us how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I believe, and I do believe this, that it's really important to have a chief nursing officer and that the chief nursing officer role is, is um, an imperative role. It's a role here that we, we have... Uh, where our chief nurse is at the table with government ministers who are you know, making decisions about nurses and nursing. Um, the role is, is, is mostly, I suppose, uh, uh, political and about policy. But hey, you know, she's, she's in there fighting for nurses every, every day. And I think that, you know, I, I didn't recognize or realize that you guys didn't have one, but I think it's something that you guys should be really fighting for and pushing for. Somebody at the top table to, to promote nursing, I think is absolutely key. My answer. I haven't given you an answer, really. <laughs> no, I agree. I think the struggle we're having, um, we are having a provincial, there are a few provincial chief nursing officers who are in a similar role that I am in BC and um, having that discussion. The issue, of course, is do we need to have chief nurses all provincially and in the territories to then be able to have a federal chief nursing officer role? I tend to think not because I actually think a leader at a federal level, it's a chicken and an egg piece, can actually set policy and recommendations that say you need to have 
a provincial chief nursing officer role that sits at, at executive tables. So uh, we are having that discussion um, provincially and nationally, I would say. But yes, I, I fully agree. I, I think that I think it could be um, it's, it would be a very important role for Canada. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer and Benny. Do you guys have anything to add? <laughs> Any final remarks? The one thing I try to do in my role as a clinical nurse specialist is that um, I know we have problems every single day, and a lot of the solutions are. Are really come out of the front line. They come out of the people who are doing the work all the time. And so I really try to make sure that one, I, I tap them on the shoulder frequently and I make sure that if I can bring them to a table to share their expertise, that I do that. Um, and then I think as you see that happen, what you'll see is you're, you're gonna see that these, these are people you really should be listening to. And there's huge value of, of bringing those voices to that table. So that I, I think that's, my, that's where I fit in that little puzzle. Yeah, I think no one will deny that a chief nursing officer for Canada would be an amazing step forward. And, um, you know, it's been interesting to hear Vinnie talk about getting invited to tables that she wasn't at before, and she's not going to vacate that seat. So I think what we see is nursing's boat rising in this pandemic, and we're all together. And we all need to push for that recognition to have a chief nursing officer um, at the federal policy table. And I absolutely believe it's achievable. And so um, perhaps when we talk about how do we get that systems level change and we talk about prioritizing, maybe that's our priority. And if we all push together, that's where we can uh, get to and what we can achieve over the course of this pandemic. Yeah, and I mean, as you said, the pandemic may be exactly the time to be sort of advocating for that and uh, making nursing uh, visible. Um, thank you so much to all of you for this really, really rich conversation. I feel like I just need a, probably a couple of hours after to reflect on some of these ideas. Now I wanna sort of uh, hand it over to Sabrina for some closing remarks. Great, thank you. And um, I just want to also really thank the panel. Um, very proud to be um, part of UBC School of Nursing and the people on this panel um, who showcase both our faculty as well as alumni. And I am totally with Jennifer in that um, we have a lot of hope in the people who are coming and graduating from UBC um, and then going places. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Um, I, I want to also have a shameless plug for the new research report that is out. And um, thank you to our Office of Nursing um, Research, Teaching, and Scholarship on, with uh, Mary Lee Hughes. Um, and so there's other things that you can also look at there in terms of our uh, uh, faculty who are doing uh, research. So if you have colleagues that couldn't make it today or just want to revisit this great discussion, the sessions are being recorded and they will be posted to the UBC School of Nursing website and YouTube later this week. So I would definitely say that um, nursing in general is on the forefront of thriving cities and communities. And we're going to take a brief intermission for about half an hour, but um, we will be coming back for the keynote lecture. And um, Yvonne Coghill will be our this year's 52nd annual Marion Woodward lecture speaker. So please do come back in half an hour. Thank you.